Hey, good morning, everybody. This is George from DinosaurGeorge.com. It is great, great, great to be making these again. Uh, I didn't realize how much I missed it until I did the one yesterday and doing the one today. So let's go. Brooke from Lavernia, Texas. I was just at that school the other day. Brooke says, are some dinosaurs reptiles? Brooke, they're not really reptiles the way we think of reptiles. Their legs aren't anything like a reptile, but they do have similarities, which means they're related to reptiles. When you look at a dinosaur, you'll notice that its legs are held directly underneath its body. True reptiles, the reptiles we see every day around us, their legs are splayed out to the side, which means their legs kind of stick out here to the side. If you're a crocodile, you walk around with your legs, well, you don't walk around like this, you'd look like a nut. But if you're a crocodile, your legs are out to the side. If you're a dinosaur, your legs are directly under your body. So dinosaurs are related because they have some similarities. If you look at things like um, skin impression, we find fossilized skin impression. Uh, that is sort of reptilian-like. The fact that they lay eggs is sort of reptilian-like. There's a lot of skeletal design that makes them similar to, to reptiles. But really, I don't like to call dinosaurs reptiles because there's a lot of dissimilarities. They are related to reptiles, but they're sort of their own thing. So my answer is no, they're not reptiles, but yes, they have a relationship. William from University Garden, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Who would win in a fight between T-Rex and Ankylosaurus? William, um, these questions are always just um, sort of my guess. There's not a lot of ways that we can prove or disprove who would win in a fight, but I will tell you this. When you find two animals, a carnivore and an herbivore that live together at the same time in the same place, what that tells you is that they, uh, the herbivore is at least successful enough to be able to defend themselves against whatever carnivores lived with him, the way nature works. You don't take an animal and stick it in with a carnivore that can kill it without any problems because that animal wouldn't live very long. There wouldn't be enough. So we do find enough ankylosauruses to know they're living right alongside of Tyrannosaurus rex, which means that at least the majority of the time, an ankylosaurus was more than a match for Tyrannosaurus rex. In my opinion, if you took an adult ankylosaurus and an adult Tyrannosaurus rex, Rex is just not gonna mess with them. He is not worth it. There's other things that he could catch. He's better off trying to ambush duckbills than he is trying to take on an ankylosaurus. So in my opinion, ankylosaurus is a pretty hard guy to beat, especially if he's an adult and the shell on his back is thick enough, the body armor is thick enough, and that club becomes heavy enough. Tough guy to deal with. All right, Brandon from Becker, Minnesota. Hey, Dinosaur George, it's your Spinosaurus freak, Brandon. <laughs> Brandon, good to hear from you, man. I know you love Spinosaurus, and I think he's pretty cool, too. I got a really big question and a small one. When you said that carnivores may have never roared or screamed, I was thinking, since predators like tigers and lions roar, why not give the same ability to carnivores? That's very, very good thinking, uh, Brandon. That's thinking like a scientist. We look at modern animals to give us an idea of how prehistoric animals acted. Now, let me clarify something, Brandon. I, I, may, have, I may have misstated or, or you may have misunderstood. Um, Obviously, I couldn't have made a mistake, so Brandon, it has to be you, baby. You had to be the one to misunderstand. I'm kidding you. Um, when I said they don't roar and scream, what I mean is when we see shows on television, and Jurassic Fight Club, my show, was just as guilty of this. We, for the, uh, for the interest of educa or education, pff, entertainment, we like to see dinosaurs roaring and screaming. What I meant was it's very unlikely that predatory dinosaurs stomped and roared and screamed all the time because it would give away their position and it would make it harder for them to catch prey. I absolutely believe that they had the ability to make sounds to be able to communicate with members of their own kind. But the idea that all these television shows always show them screaming and roaring and that's for entertainment, but I don't think that's realistic. You don't see lions just constantly roaring, especially when they are in hunting mode. The last thing they want to do is give away their position. So yes, I agree with you. Carnivores would have had that ability and certainly would have used it, but not, they would have used it sparingly. They only would have used it when it was necessary to communicate with other members of their family or perhaps to scare away rivals or something like that. 
Uh, here's the second question. And do you think there may have been dinosaurs that roam my home state of Minnesota? Have an awesome day on this day, on the day that you read this. Peace, Spinosaurus Brandon. Well, Brian, uh, Spinosaurus Brandon, thank you so much for the kind words. It's very courteous of you. I hope you have a good day today as well. Um, yes, I absolutely do believe dinosaurs roamed in every single state in the United States. The fact that we don't find their bones doesn't mean they weren't there. It just means that the layer that holds their bones is so deep that you or I may never have the opportunity to ever see one. Were dinosaurs in Minnesota? Yes, the Vikingosaurus was in Minnesota. Okay, I totally made that up. That was for you, Brandon. That's the worst joke I've ever told, but I did it for you. So there you go, Vikingosaurus. Yeah, that's, that's a great joke. <laughs> All right, my very good friend, Emma, from Noblesville, Indiana. Hello, Dinosaur George. It's Emma once again. Emma, can't tell you how much I enjoy hearing from you. And I tell you, I'd like to tell you uh, uh, how much our friendship means. I really enjoy talking to you. Um, I first off wanted to congratulate you on your recent success with educating the youth of our nation. And thank you once again for offering your knowledge to those like me who enjoy talking to you and learning more about the creatures we love since childhood. Uh, Emma, it is my pleasure. And what makes it worthwhile is things like your letter, your friendship, uh, the, the look on these kids' faces when they see these things. It makes it all worthwhile, and thank you so very much for taking the time to, to mention it. My first question is, how are you able to tell the life cycle of a dinosaur and how long they typically lived? Woo, woo, very good question. It's very tough to do. There's a number of different methods. There's one that, my gosh, how could I forget his name? In Florida, brilliant man, absolutely brilliant paleontologist. I cannot believe I forgot his name. Anyway, man, I, I'm so sorry. He's figured out, if I understand correctly, that he can do slices of the rib and look at basically growth patterns to help determine the age of a dinosaur. Uh, I am so embarrassed that I forgot that man's name because he is in, he's a brilliant guy and really one of my favorite paleontologists. My God, stage fright. Camera came on, can't remember. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he thinks that, that he's figured out a way to determine the age by looking. Think of it sort of like growth rings of a tree. It's not exactly that, but it's something similar to that. Uh, and there's other ways. You can look at wear and tear on the bone, and you can compare that to the wear and tear of bones of modern animals, like the knee joint, for instance. The older you are, the more you use your knees, and the more wear and tear uh, is applied to them. You can kind of look at other animals today and kind of estimate their age by looking at those sort of things. So that's one of the ways it's, it's growth patterns, the cell structure of the bone, and it's also wear and tear gives us, I would say, pretty good estimate. Um, uh, the other question is, um, I was also wondering if the gender of a dinosaur is established based on the pelvic bone. I'm assuming the female would need a wider pelvic bone in order to produce and lay eggs. I could be wrong, but I'd love to know. Thank you again, Dinosaur George. My thoughts and prayers are ours with you. Thank you, Emma. You're so incredibly polite. Um, what a great question. Uh, here's the deal. Let me see if I can pick up my little assistant here. First, I'll get a little better shot. Let me pick up my little assistant. This is my little assistant. This is a little Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'll do a cutaway shot so you can. Here's the deal. Emma, what you were talking about is, could it be that these bones that make up the pelvic region, is there a variation there that would help determine is it male or female? It's a great question. Uh, I know that there are each, each Tyrannosaurus I've ever had the chance to look at, they're all distinctively different. So it may not be these bones to look at, what it may be, are these bones back here in the back. I read an article once where somebody suggested, these are, are chevrons, these bones coming down from the base of the tail are chevrons. And if I understand correctly, some specimens are found with chevrons that start further back. The first one isn't this close. Well, here is where the eggs would emerge from the animal. And if there's a chevron immediately in front of that spot, it would prevent the eggs from coming out. So it could be that the proper way to determine the sex of a dinosaur is not look at the pelvis, it's look at the chevrons and where they begin on the tail. 
These tail vertebrae, tail verts are called caudal vertebrae, these caudal vertebrae have attachment points. So we know where the first chevron starts because you would actually see a spot on the bone that would tell you. So the idea is that if the chevrons begin further back on the tail, that would allow for the egg to pass through and therefore that would be a female. Now, whether or not that is the proper uh, way to determine the sex of one, we don't know, but I will tell you that uh, it is pretty incredible. It's a pretty good idea if you stop and think about it. All right, Mike from Farmingham, Massachusetts, were all theropods bipedal? Good question, Mike. Very cool question. Uh, for some of you little guys, what Mike is asking, theropods are meat-eating dinosaurs and bipedal means you walk on just your two hind legs. Mike, to the best of my knowledge, yes, all theropods were bipedal. Now, it does appear that Baryonyx and perhaps Spinosaurus and maybe Suchomimus and maybe uh, Irritator may have been capable of walking on all fours. They may have had that capability. There's no evidence to support it. My, I mean, there, there's no way to really support it. My, the reason why I say that is because when we look at them, their arms are pretty beefy. They have a little more strength, and that may have been a comfortable position to hunt, especially if those dinosaurs were fish eaters. So to the best of my knowledge, all theropods are bipedal, uh, but those dinosaurs I named may possibly have been capable of walking quadrupedally. Ooh, big words today, everybody. Big words, that makes me very smart. You know, to, to, to look smart, you always should put your hand on your chin and do your head up and down and go, hmm, yeah, yeah. So there you go. Um, there's, your, there's your lesson on how to look really smart. All right, finally, Gwen from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Who would win in a fight, a woolly mammoth or a T-Rex? Well, Gwen, I, and I'm sure you know this, those animals didn't live together. They never saw each other, so they would have never come in contact with, the, with, with each other. But for the sake of fun and the sake of making a guess, my opinion is Tyrannosaurus rex was just way too big and too powerful. Um, a woolly mammoth, especially some of the big ones like the imperial mammoths and mammoth trogon theory and some of those big guys, they certainly could have held their own for a little while, but... Tyrannosaurus rex, all he had to do was get his teeth into him and that would have been the end of the mammoth. So I don't think there's any hope that a mammoth could have survived something like a Tyrannosaurus rex. But it's still kind of fun to question those things and I kind of enjoy doing it. All right, thank you guys so much. Again, it's great talking to you all. If you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page. Send me your question. I'll try my best to answer it. For everybody out there, I always appreciate the courtesy. It does make it so much more enjoyable to talk to you guys. One of the things that aggravates me about the world of paleontology is there's this really small handful of smug little characters who believe that they are so smart, nobody, nobody is as smart as they are. And they love to go in and, and attack ideas and questions and comments. They love to do that. And to me, I feel terrible for them because man, what a miserable life to think that you're so unhappy that the only thing that brings you joy is to convince yourself that you've denigrated somebody else. It's terrible. It's one of the things I like about all the people that I get questions from. You guys that visit these things, you're always courteous, you're always kind. I appreciate that very much. I only ask that you, uh, you use the same manners you use with me to other people you come in contact in your life because it makes the world a better place. For you little guys out there, make sure to practice your reading because reading is incredibly important. And to everybody, Take care of yourself, take care of the people around you, and I will see you all soon.